You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, here's your hosts, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 23. I am one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And he's O8OT. Today's story? Today's story would be Aqualung by Sean C. Hayden. Sean Hayden is, among other things, a registered nurse, living, working, and writing in Savannah, Georgia. Originally from Boston, Massachusetts, he bears his damn Yankee title proudly. Sean's fiction has appeared in a number of journals and magazines in the U.S. and Canada. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. His website is under construction at the moment, but the address is www.schayden.com. In the meantime, you can find him at his MySpace page. Today's music is Breathe by Triad, and there will be a link to their music in the show notes. Aqualung by S.C. Hayden. Floating face down in the black, dirty water, his arms and legs hanging beneath him, Marty Coyne felt weightless. The click of the regulator valve, the rush of compressed air, and the soft bubbling when he exhaled were all magnified underwater. His diving mask was pushed up onto the top of his head, and his eyes were closed. Focused on the rhythm of his breathing, muscles relaxed. He could sleep that way. Rising and falling in the harbor's gentle swell, the blaring car horns from the nearby traffic were distant and muffled at the far edges of perception. When Marty Coyne submerges his face in water, chain reactions of physiological responses begin. His heart rate slows to less than 40 beats per minute. Blood is shunted from his body's periphery toward its core, and oxygen is conserved for the brain and vital organs. It is similar to the physiology of hibernation. The parasympathetic nervous system takes over and slows everything way down. The phenomenon is called the mammalian diving reflex. It's the reason whales are able to descend to such incredible depths with a single breath of air. But the reflex occurs to some degree in all mammals. It's also the reason that in case after case, children who've fallen into water and remain submerged for sometimes well over an hour have been successfully revived without any neurological damage. The mammalian diving reflex, quite strong during human infancy, diminishes with age, but never vanishes completely. People have learned to induce the latent mammalian adaptation, have learned to hone and strengthen the response. Floating face down in the water, they reach trance-like states of deep relaxation. Marty Coyne uses the technique before every dive. A muffled voice cut through the sound of the regulator, and a hand shook his left shoulder. Marty! It was his partner, Carlos. Marty lifted his head out of the water and floated vertically next to Carlos. The police boat bobbed up and down, quietly beside them, small waves lapping its hull, the engines off. I don't know how you can do that shit in this filthy water. Before a real dive, sure, snorkeling in the Grand Caymans, diving for lobster in Maine. But this? Carlos said, waving his hand at the water around them. Come on, man, let's get this thing over with. Marty smiled at his partner and pulled his mask down over his eyes. You're the boss, Marty said. He placed the regulator back in his mouth, tapped himself on the top of his head, and began his descent. The divers let themselves sink about six feet down before switching on their lights, turning over and descending the remaining twelve feet head first. The water quickly faded from a murky brown to deep black. 
When they saw the bottom begin to take shape in the darkness, they separated and swam slowly over the muddy harbor floor. Marty Coyne moved through the black water, holding his light beneath him. The skeletal structure of a shopping carriage materialized, wispy strands of fine green algae clinging to its rusted metal bars, and then vanished. Tires, a car door, cinder blocks, a bicycle, a street vendor's hot dog cart all took form momentarily in the gloom and disappeared again as the light swept slowly over them. Everything finds its way into the harbor, his partner Carlos had once told him. Everything. And it was true. Marty had seen all kinds of unlikely objects on the junk-strewn harbor bottom over the years. A prosthetic leg, an entire telephone booth. He'd wondered if some unfortunate person had been inside it when it went into the drink. A riding lawnmower, and enough guns to open a store. He remembered when, years ago, on his first body recovery dive, he'd been descending through the murky water, nervous and excited. And as he neared the bottom, he saw a figure emerge from the shadows directly beneath him. It was the figure of a man standing perfectly erect, one arm extended out as if reaching to shake an unseen hand. Marty wondered if it was some weird form of rigor mortis. He was spellbound, circling around the ghostly figure who stood straight but casual. The picture of serenity when all at once Marty realized he was circling around a department store mannequin. The divers hovered low over the harbor's bottom. Even with the powerful lights, visibility was limited to no more than a few feet. Gliding slowly, peering into the darkness, watching shapes take form in the shadows, Marty would rise and fall, moving with the contours of the seabed. He was careful not to disturb the muddy floor, not wanting the muck to rise up in clouds and obliterate his vision completely. On a body recovery, if you find what you're looking for, you're usually close enough to reach out and touch it. They were looking for a kid named Jimmy Costa, an informant whose body, according to another informant, was dumped last night. Jimmy was arrested last year after selling cocaine to an undercover federal agent and since then he'd been meeting with a detective from the Bureau once a week. Jimmy wasn't connected, but he ran with a few people who were. He was close to one of South Boston's heavyweight coke movers, so the Bureau, thinking it might be useful, cut him a deal. But someone apparently didn't think Jimmy Costa was useful at all. The FBI didn't know if Costa's cover as a snitch had been blown, or if he'd gotten himself killed over something else, something he hadn't been telling them about. The informant who told them about Costa being dumped had a fairly good idea who ordered the hit. So if they could find the body, maybe they could tie it to the killers, who, under the right kind of pressure, might come clean about who paid them, or turn informant themselves. It was a never-ending game. The FBI gave Boston PD the location and asked them to get their divers into the water. With his breathing as the only sound in the surrounding silence, Marty was constantly reminded of the presence of cancer cells in his lungs. It had been exactly one year since he'd been diagnosed, and exactly one year since he'd had a cigarette. Marty never thought about smoking when he was underwater. When he was underwater, time stood still. It was when he reached the surface and took his first breath of uncompressed air that the urge would hit him like a freight train. Lately, Marty was finding it difficult to concentrate on these dives. He would move along through the cold, dark water, thinking of nothing, feeling as though he might like to continue on that way forever. It was as though he would forget what he was supposed to be doing down there, or that at some point he would have to return to the surface. There was a pleasant tranquility that came with surrendering to the totality of submersion, sinking, sinking into the unknowable gloom of the harbor's icy belly. A greenish-blue glow emerged from the blackness beside Marty Coyne, he thought that it must be Carlos's light and turned toward it, reaching out to gently push his partner away so they wouldn't collide and tangle their gear. Someone was swimming beside him, but it wasn't Carlos. The swimmer was surrounded by a weird, translucent green light. He drew closer to Marty, the light growing stronger, until he was almost next to him. The swimmer wasn't very good. 
He struggled to keep pace, using an awkward dog paddle. He had a cigarette clenched in his teeth and was panting around it. Finally, he pulled the butt out of his mouth and gasped, drawing the murky water in through his mouth and shooting it out of his nose in twin bubbly jets, trying to catch his breath. The tip of his cigarette burned with an eerie green light in the darkness. Marty knew who it was. He recognized him from his picture. It was Jimmy Costa. I don't think I can get used to this shit, Marty. I was never a good swimmer, you know. None of us city kids are, I guess. <laughs> Jimmy said and laughed, green bubbles bursting from his mouth. And this fucking water, woo-wee! I knew it was dirty, but not this fucking dirty. Jimmy was wearing a Puma tracksuit, black with red stripes running down the sides of the legs and arms. It would have been invisible in the inky dark if not for the blue-green light surrounding him. He had on a pair of white Reebok high tops. If we find him, Marty thought, it will be the sneakers that we see first. Listen, Marty. Jimmy said. I know what you're planning on doing, and I just want to go on record as saying I think it's the right thing. But that's just me, always thinking the angles. Not everybody that's down here wants to see you do this. Marty switched off his light, and the muddy bottom fell away. All at once, he was swallowed by the impossible black. Jimmy Costa smiled. I think I'm looking at a man who's already made up his mind, he said. Of course, Marty didn't need Jimmy Costa to help him make any decisions. And no, he hadn't made up his mind. He switched his light off, hoping that Jimmy Costa's spectral form would disappear along with everything else, leaving him alone, suspended in the darkness. But Jimmy remained, glowing like a firefly. All right, Marty. All right. I can see you want to be alone. So I'll just take off for a bit. But you're going to have to deal with her, one way or another. Jimmy said. He put his cigarette back into his mouth and dog paddled away into the murk. Marty wondered what he meant by deal with her when another figure emerged from the black. It was a woman radiating a fierce white light. Marty actually felt the water around him grow warmer. And he thought that if he were to reach out and touch her, he would burn his hand. She seemed far more at home in the water than Jimmy Costa had, twisting her body and slicing through the dark. She moved like a serpent. Marty didn't recognize her at first. Her features were lost in the white glare, but when she spoke, her words reverberated inside of his head and he knew her at once. Her name was Karen, his first wife, the mother of his two boys. She died ten years ago in a car crash. So, Marty, this is what it's come to. You want to drown yourself in the harbor like a rat. That is your noble plan? Karen asked, hands on her hips. That was just like Karen, always turning on the drama. He'd never thought about it as being noble, just practical. The facts were simple. He and Susan, his current wife, didn't have life insurance, besides what he'd had through the department, and that was next to nothing. Of course, signing on now would be too damn expensive since he'd been diagnosed, and everything he'd read on the internet about small cell lung cancer, doctors don't tell you shit, was that he would be gone in a few years, one way or another. And what about her, Marty? What about Susan? Do you want her to have nightmares, Marty, the way that you did after... There was something about hearing her mention Susan that pissed him off in a way he couldn't describe. Who is she to assess his relationship? Was she comparing herself to Susan? Marty knew that he had never loved Susan the way that he'd loved her. But he hadn't told Karen to go and get herself killed, had he? And Susan was good. They had their problems, but she was good. And she'd been a great mother to the boys. What about our boys, Marty? What about them? Karen asked, interrupting his thoughts. Did she say our boys? They're my boys now, Karen. You're not here. But I am here, Marty. I'm here, and I know what you're planning, and I'm telling you to forget it. She sliced back and forth through the water, pulsing with white light. She was beautiful, stunning, like some kind of fiery angel filled with the wrath of God. This isn't the place for you, Marty. Down here in the mud, in the cold. Your place is up there with them, with her. Don't abandon them. There she goes again with the drama, he thought. She was the one who had done the abandoning, even if it hadn't been her fault. Besides, didn't she understand what was going on here? 
obligations to family notwithstanding, he was going to die. Marty, angry now, turned away from her. Who did she think she was anyway, showing up like this after all of those years? Marty grumbled inside, suddenly recalling all of the times Karen had made him second-guess himself. He was searching for the right words to tell her that it wasn't her decision. When he was distracted by a second light, welling up in the murky dark, it was a deep red light surrounding a woman with long, silver hair. She swam up out of the gloom with graceful, arching movements, like a dolphin. She was nude. Her silver hair fanned out in the water over her shoulders and around her breasts. Her skin was burning luminous red, and underneath her navel, it changed to deep green like a rooster's tail. The lower half of her body was the tail of a fish, a mermaid. Marty recognized the apparition, even though he hadn't seen her for 32 years. Her name was Doris Kelly, and she'd been Marty Coyne's 7th grade English teacher. There has never been a woman upon whom Marty Coyne had expended more energy fantasizing about than Mrs. Kelly. Marty used to spend his entire English class gazing at her legs, crossed beneath her desk. And although he'd hung on every word she said, watched her lips form each sound with rapt attention, he barely passed the class. Oh, Marty, she said to him now, you've grown into such a remarkable man. To sacrifice yourself for the sake of your children, your wife? I always knew you were special, Marty. Little Marty Coyne. She turned her head to the side and brought her chin down to her shoulder, her hair rising up, silver flashing through the red aura. Marty watched the swell of her breast and reached out slowly, forgetting for a moment everything else. Marty! Karen shouted. Are you going to listen to that slut? Her voice cut through him like a knife. She always did have a filthy mouth when she was riled up about something. Don't worry, the mermaid Mrs. Kelly said, looking at Karen. I've never loved your Marty. I'm just his fantasy. She looked back at Marty and smiled. Marty, did you know I died of emphysema? Cigarettes killed us both. Don't you think it's romantic? Don't you think it's romantic? Karen mimicked in a sing-song voice, shaking her head. Mrs. Kelly looked directly at Karen and narrowed her eyes. If Marty starts chemotherapy and radiation treatment, he'll get sick and he won't be able to work. Short-term disability insurance will cover them for a while, but eventually they won't be able to manage. The medical bills, the loss of income, it will all pile up and poor Susan will have to carry the load. And when he finally dies, she and the boys will be left with nothing but debt. But if something were to happen, some kind of accident, then Susan would be entitled to the benefits for survivors of an officer killed in the line of duty. They'd be taken care of, wouldn't they, Marty? Mrs. Kelly whispered this last part, soft and seductive. Is she trying to convince me, or are you still trying to convince yourself, Marty? Karen asked him, her voice icy and sharp. Marty was quickly growing annoyed with the two women, twisting and turning in the gentle current beside him. He needed to be alone for this. He switched on his flashlight, and they both disappeared. Once more, he trained his light's beam on the muddy floor beneath him and swam forward. Something white was visible on the black bottom. Marty moved closer and saw Jimmy Costa's white Reeboks. Costa lay on his back his legs raised slightly off the seabed. He had a thick metal chain wrapped several times around his torso, holding his arms in. His face was swollen and blue. Marty thought of Jacob Marley from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, with his huge chain wrapped around his body. Imagined Jimmy Costa saying, I have forged this chain, link by link, in a ghostly voice and shuddered. Marty remembered the glowing blue-green Jimmy Costa who had been swimming beside him, thought perhaps he should have tried telling him that he was nothing more than an underdone potato or a blob of mustard. You're nothing more than nitrogen narcosis, Jimmy. You're nothing more than the product of an oxygen-starved mind, the hallucination of a man whose lungs are thick with cancer. You... Once again, Marty Coyne switched his light off. You were right, Jimmy. You were looking at a man who had already made up his mind. 
Marty Coyne continued to swim forward in the darkness, passing over Jimmy Costa and beyond. He thought about whales, their massive bodies falling gracefully down through the water, reaching such incredible depths, their heart rates slowed to three or four beats per minute. Each dive was a little hibernation, a little death. He closed his eyes, pulled the diving mask from his face, and let it drop into the black. Everything finds its way into the harbor. He let his arms and legs hang down beneath him, feeling as though he were weightless. Marty Coyne let the regulator fall from his mouth. He wondered if it was necessary for whales to sleep, or if their bodies' metabolisms were sufficiently rested when they made their deep and long dives. Did they dream on those dives? Did they know the difference? Author's Note. Parts of this story come from personal experience. Several years back, I did some commercial diving work in Europe. Most of the water I worked in was pretty murky stuff. If you've ever spent any time underwater in those conditions, you know how surreal it can be. After a while, you start to see patterns and forms in the dark. It's kind of like cloud watching. I've seen all kinds of phantom shapes underwater when the visibility was bad. As for the rest of the story, someone very close to me briefly considered doing something similar to the protagonist in this story. That someone has since died of cancer. Those ideals and experiences percolated over the years, as ideas and experiences will do, and the story grew from there. Okay, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed Aqualung by Sean Hayden. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. What? Aqualung. Isn't whoa. that what I said? No, you said Aqualung. Aqualung, huh. That's what you said. Must have been hanging out with my wife too much. That's weird. Well, she was telling me the other day that she heard they were going to make an Aquaman movie. So yeah. No one would go see an Aquaman. Arthur Curry wouldn't go see an Aquaman movie, dude. It's probably true. So, yeah... It was a poignant story. I don't know. With the amount of stories now that we've done on suicide on this show, you might think that we're in favor of it. But actually... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I'm in favor of suicide. Oh, okay. Well, you might think that we're both in favor of it. But actually, we're not both in favor of suicide. Just one of us thinks suicide is painless and loves to listen to that song oh. over and oh. over and over oh. again. <laughs> Please make it stop. <laughs> By the time you finish hearing it, you will commit suicide. It's the law. This story was making me think a lot. It's kind of interesting. There's that movie Sling Blade. I don't know if you if you remember that. Uh, it had Billy Bob Thornton on there as a uh, mentally challenged gentleman that liked to kill people with sling blades. Some, some people, some call, people it, call it a sling blade. <laughs> so what was the other blade name? Some people call it a sling blade. Some Switch people... blade, I would imagine. Anyways, back to it. So in this movie, Billy Bob's character befriends a boy who doesn't have a father anymore. And during the course of the movie, you find out what happened to this boy's father. And this was a part that was always really uh, meaningful to me when I watched this movie. And I think I saw it a few times because I had a roommate that was really into that movie when I was in college. But anyways... There's the part where he's talking about what happened to his father. And he says that his father was ashamed that he wasn't able to give his family the kind of life that they deserved. And so he decided to kill himself. And the little boy says, I don't really care what kind of life he could have given me or couldn't have given me. I just would really like to have a dad. And uh, 
I remember at the time, you know, I hadn't even graduated from college. I hadn't gotten anywhere in life. And that was one of my huge fears. I expected to graduate from college and be completely unable to hold down any kind of worthwhile employment. And I'd have to be working at, I don't know, the 7-Eleven or working at the grocery store, which actually was what I did for a year after graduating from college, sadly. You know, that was something that I actually thought about and worried about. And when I heard that line in that story that really meant something to me. And it really came across to me is that every life is important. Everybody has someone who loves them. And so there's no such thing as a painless suicide. Sorry. <laughs> it's really, there is no such thing. No matter who does it, somebody's going to be hurt by it. And in this story, this character can come up with a good reason for what he's doing, but I still think he's wrong. I still think that his family would be much better off if he was to spend time with them. No matter what happens in the future, the time that he would have spent with them would have meant so much more to his sons and to his new wife than any pension that they could get from the police department or, or whatever. Rambling on more, I'm, I guess I'm the one who's going to talk all the time here. But uh, my mother died, and unfortunately I was a teenager at the time. And so I was so completely self-absorbed that I didn't take the time to, you know, make the best of the last year that my mother had from the time that she found out that she had cancer to the time that she died. I was too stupid to use that time worthwhile because I was a teenager and all I cared about was what my friends were doing this weekend and, you know, what was going on in my life and... Now she's gone, and I look back, and I don't have a lot of memories that I can uh, call up to remember my mom with. It's really unfortunate. You know, there there are times that we have, and, you know, everybody has a life that they can uh, share with someone. And I guess what I'm trying to say is live your life. Make every day good. Seize the day. That kind of stuff. What did you think of the story, Rish? I've talked for so long that people forgot that we're a team here. <laughs> that absence of me talking is is the sound of me hanging from the ceiling rafters right now. I, I thought it was really, really good. I, I agree with you there. I don't know how in depth we want to talk about how we accept these stories, but I, I know I read this one first and then I forwarded it on to you. And I, in my email, I said, I don't know if you'll like the story, especially the ending. But I liked it a lot. It sort of reminds me of arguments I've had with people about suicide in the past. I, I didn't know if it would be your cup of tea, but I'm glad that you dug it. Uh, That's a good story, definitely. But it did feel right to me to put it on this podcast. I don't know. We had a reader send us an email recently. He was talking about a submission. He said, this story was good, but I don't know if it's right for the Dune Steve. <laughs> and so I guess we have some kind of uh, style. Maybe there's a kind of story that uh, we do that's our own kind of thing. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I thought this was a Dune Steve story myself. I, I... Hey, Big? Yeah? <laughs> what, is the, what does the word Dune Steve mean? Uh, I don't know if I should say. Why not? Well, it's kind of... Look, I'll tell you off the air, all right? No, no, no. Come on. I want to know. And, and, and somebody out there is bound to care just as much as I do. I think you overestimate our audience. Look, I told you about the time I hugged Richard Simmons. Yes, you did. And people are still laughing. And I told you the story of taking my pants off in front of Ryan Reynolds. Uh, Rish? Yes? I sort of edited that one out. I didn't want you to look like a freak or something. Oh. Well, um, uh, do you think that maybe you could edit it out again? Okay. So that I... A dune steep is a big South American frog. Uh, ugly sucker lives in the rainforest around the Amazon basin. Only natives can look upon it without irreversible damage. Wow. Really? Hey, Big, you lived in South America once, didn't you? See, si. More day. Uh, uh, uh did, did you ever see one? Sure. Uh, that's why I used it for the name of our podcast. Okay, cool. Thanks. Well, well, well wait, wait, you said only natives can look at them. Yes. You're from California. I am. And you saw Dune Steve. Twice. So what was the irreversible damage? Well, any white man who gazes at a Dune Steve becomes violently ill at the memory. Really? Indeed. Twice. Yes. I don't get it. Then let's just move on. If you'd like to donate to the show... But, but, but it doesn't make sense. Uh, okay, what don't you get? 
Well, you've been talking about your experience for two minutes now. I have. And you haven't become violent. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a minute. <laughs> Gross, dude! This is kind of your fault, you know. Yeah, I guess. Can we move on now? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, hey, I, I got to admit that uh, as of right now when we're recording this, I, I haven't heard the story. This is one that you had someone else edit for us. Yeah, that's right. We had Rick edit the story for us. He also was the one who edited uh, Cat Prince Distinguishes Himself for us, and I think he does a great job. So, uh, hey, I hope it turned out good. Uh, and another thing that Rick did is uh, he threw together a really nice-looking bit of art to go along with this story. That's right. I saw it, and it was really cool, and I was hoping that... Maybe we could do this for every story. Yeah, we'll have to see how that works out. Because we have had a piece of art for each issue. Right. And that's what I thought this was when he sent it. I was like, oh, okay, well, we're just at the beginning of the issue, but we've already got a picture. But you said that it was just for this story, so great. Yeah, I was hoping to be able to do one for each week. We'll have to see how it goes. Also, we'd like to thank Liz Mirzieski, who uh, did one of the voices in this story. Thank you. Oh, hey, you know what? We have one more bit of news. Right. Do you remember months and months ago? I think it was November. We did a reading for Starship Sofa. Quick, give me your best Tony Smith impression. This is the Starship Sofa. Everybody, welcome. Whoa, where did Big go? <laughs> Bring Big back into the <laughs> oh, room. Oh, dear. He talks exactly like that. It's the <laughs> greatest accent or the worst accent in the world. You be the judge. But yeah, www.starshipsofa.com, we read the main story, which is Flight Risk by Mark Laidlaw, and it finally made it onto the onto, airwaves. Onto the sofa. The that's, sofa. That's right. We, we're on there, so check it out. We've got a link even on our page where you can uh, click on that and head right over to the Starship Sofa reading and check that out. It's, it's a really good story, so it'll be worth your while. And we've since done another reading. We'll let you know when that goes up. Yeah, and look last to week that. we read another story, right? We read our third That's story. That's right, our third that. one. You know, he's got really, really high quality stuff. Yeah. I guess every week he manages to do a two hour podcast with short stories, with poetry, with factoids, <laughs> <laughs> fact articles, inspirational messages, hymns, all sorts of <laughs> prayers for the dying. He doesn't do any of those things, does he? Rish, you're such an idiot. <laughs> he does say Starship Sofa. The guy is amazing, the stuff that he can pack into a show. Someday we hope to do as much. Would that be cool? Would anybody think that would be cool to have a Flash story and then a main event story? Oh, hell no, Big Anglovich. Well, the well, audience has not. spoken. All right. Imagine. Thanks for uh, stopping by, announcer man. Uh huh? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? I really enjoy reading these stories, and I hope that, uh, Sean, if you're listening, why, why, why wouldn't he? Oh, maybe he turned it off by now. <laughs> but if you've stuck around, Sean, I hope that we did justice to your tale. Yeah. All right. So if you have a story you'd like to submit. Hey, well, can I interrupt you? Sure. Can you do this whole thing in three sentences? Go. Okay. One. Wait, that doesn't count. <laughs> Two. Holy cow, <laughs> dude, you are effed. <laughs> If you have a story you'd like to submit to the Dune Steef, just put it in the body of an email and send it to submissions at dunesteef.com. That's that one, one sentence, yeah. All right, so I did it. That's cool. Uh, you didn't <laughs> mention the submission guidelines. You didn't, but that's that's fine. Okay, well, you mention them then, since uh, I don't have any more sentences. Oh, no, just if you go to the website, click on submission guidelines, that sort of gives you a, a heads up as to what we're looking for. That's right. And do us all a favor and please proofread your story. Or better yet, have someone else proofread it. Because when you proofread your own story, you have a tendency to just skip right over those errors because you know what it's supposed to say. Yeah, it's interesting how the brain does that because I can have the third draft of my story and it still has a attic in it instead of an attic, you know, and it's just one of those things where I would never know. But we enjoy reading people's submissions and we think that that's pretty great. We also enjoy the comments of the people who listen to the podcast and to our ramblings after the podcast. And uh, you can just hey, go on hey, to... The... two sentences. Tell people about leaving a comment on the uh, blog page. Go. I think I could quite easily tell them that on www.doonsteef.com, they can leave a comment right there on the blog. If you said or, and... 
But, but <laughs> how does that song go from? Uh, I'm sure I don't know. What's your function? Warning: This episode contains singing. Take your life now. I thought you were anti-suicide. Oh, I am. Don't Listen take you. your life. That's bad. Okay, smart guy. You also have two sentences to ask for donations. I get two? You get one now. <laughs> There's, there you go. Zing! I won't count laughing as a <laughs> sentence. Please press the button. Uh, huh? Let's see if Announcer Man can do it in one sentence. Go, Announcer Man. Please press the button. Oh, you just did the same thing that I did. That's cheating. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> okay, yeah. how about you try it? We pay our authors. One sentence, with... it's over. <laughs> oh, no, 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 conjunction, okay. pal. Okay, go, go, yeah, go. Wait, is with a conjunction? No, it's something else, I think. I don't know. With the money that is given to us via donations. The end. <laughs> Nothing and... else important. <laughs> You're crazy, dude. Nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, oh, 80T. In looking at the whole technical aspect of this podcast, which I try not to look at because it's just too daunting, it appears that this is going to be the last episode of this month. Mm -hmm. So probably. we got the whole broken mirror story event thing going, which you probably already know unless you're Sean Hayden and this is the first episode you're listening to. <laughs> Although he was the guy that said that he liked our podcast. Yeah, maybe uh, he has listened before. On oh. it, eh? Oh, wait, OT is the only intelligent one here. So do you want to briefly explain the whole broken mirror event in case somebody is just tuning in? And hopefully there's still enough time to make that deadline go. Yeah, the broken mirror story event is basically the contest where we give a premise for a story. And then everyone who wishes to participate takes that premise and writes a story from it. The fun part of it is just to see how different the stories can be when they're all based on the same premise. So within the month of April, you are supposed to write your broken mirror story. And your premise is this. Someone arrives in town. That's it? And discovers. Yeah? That everyone there. Okay, you've got me. Is exactly the same. Whoa. So there you have it. That's the premise. You take that premise and you come up with a story that goes along with it. Now, granted, a scary story is probably much less yeah. limiting it's much, than much whatever. much broader right. thing that you can wear, a much broader canvas to work with. But yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. Uh, there's a lot of writers that I've heard say that they really enjoy contests. I don't know if you call this a contest because there's not going to be one winner. Well, hey, if you're the only entrant and your story is good, then you'll be the winner. Yeah, you're the one winner. You won the contest. How about that? Also, with the October Scary Story event, we didn't say that so-and-so is the winner. Right. Uh, we just thought, okay, the stories that were good, we will read. Mm -hmm. And I think the same way on same this. Same thing, definitely. I think that it would be fun to write a story. Maybe, maybe we could participate. I don't know. Well, it's of course, fun. I'll all win. But... I need an excuse to write. I need some kind of pressure. Yeah. Um, and that's just something we can talk about in future episodes. What motivates you to write? When, when do you do your best writing? Things like that we can uh -huh. talk about. Having a deadline definitely helps, even if I'm lame and go past it like I did with October Scary Story event. Hey, I still too. finished, which means something, I guess. It does. You know, if I had a dime for every concept or part of a story or beginning of a screenplay I have that never finished, that never went anywhere, I could never ask for donations <laughs> again, dude. It's tell me just, about it. I've got like a drawer full in my brain. And I'll, I'll just pull them out sometimes and just tell, oh, yeah, I had this idea for a story once. And I'll tell you the story. And you're like, wow, that sounds like a good story. Can I read it? I haven't written it. I just thought of it. Well, see, I'm guilty of the same thing. And shoplifting. So, you know, <laughs> if you're one of those people, if you, the listener, John Smith, are one of those people who can set aside a half hour a day or an hour a day and say, I write from... 12 to 12 30 every night and you do yeah, i salute you sir i've because tried to say that a whole bunch of times and never ever gotten beyond like one day i'm the world's laziest flabbiest bastard <laughs> and i have been better at exercise regiments than at writing wow you can go to our website and read a little bit more detail there 
It is in the submission guidelines. Uh, you can go there, check out the rules to it. Do you want to know something totally crazy? Sure. We already had somebody send one to us. Really? Yeah, isn't that rad? That is so rad. You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh, no, no, no. Buzz look, an alien! I just thought it was great that somebody out there is totally unlike me and didn't wait <laughs> until the last second. That was going to be my next question. How is your story coming along, Rich? It's coming. I think it was on the drive here last week for our recording session. Then uh -huh. I thought, I'm going to come up with three ways that this could go, three possibilities for our premise. Uh -huh. I carry my little MP3 player, which I also use as a recording device sometimes. And so I recorded on there. I was like, okay, I'm not going to push stop until I come up with three. And, uh, and I did. The one that I liked the best, I sat down and started typing up. I hope that I can actually finish it in time, knowing me, it's going to spiral out of control. It's going to be 16,000 <laughs> words. And Similar to the October scary story event. Gosh, how long would you say that sucker was? 12,000 probably? Probably, yeah. Did we tell the, the listener? Oh, I was like, okay. And I had the door open the second I read the last sentence. It's like the end. <laughs> Get out! <laughs> But I'm better than I usually am with this thing, and I, I've actually started it. That's good. I have started mine, but eh, I'm not very far. I'm like a couple paragraphs in is all, unfortunately. You have until the 30th. You think you can do it? I think I probably can. I think You know, I just have to put the time in and uh, ignore reading submissions and ignore editing for the podcast and all that other unimportant stuff and just do the real worthwhile thing. All right. That light at the end of the tunnel looks like the end of our episode. It's just a train. It always is. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we'd like to thank Sean Hayden for his story. This has been Rish Outfield. And Big Anglovich. Thanks for listening to the Dunes Deep Audio. Oh, no. What? What is it? <laughs> Audio Fiction Magazine. Good night. Is that an olive? Ah, uh, yeah. I had Subway for lunch. Mm, that sounds good. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. So in that movie, uh, Billy Bob's character befriends a younger man. He's like a, a, probably about 12 or 10 or something like that. Is that a man? A young man? No? Okay. Well, you said a younger man. Let, me, just like, let wow. me start over then. No, no, who cares? Let's keep I going. Do. I want to, I want to, no. Well, your son is probably around there. Do, is he a younger man? Not a younger man, but he's. A, you could call him a young man. Young man, there's a place you can go. It's got to be just a fear that, maybe not. Because like babies, you throw them in the water and they're like, <laughs> it's like uh, unless you chained a brick around, <laughs> unless you tied a brick to them <laughs> like yeah. I do. Um, you throw them in the water without, like, some sort of a flotation device, and they're not just going to go, <laughs> they're going to just go. <laughs> really? See, because <laughs> I had been taught that because of amniotic fluid or whatever, babies are super at home in the water when they're first born. And well, they like bathtubs, but. Well, but lots of times they they're say. They're not going to like the, to go under the water. They say the best place to give birth is under is under the water, and. and a baby that's there's no shock to the system mm. of you know the sudden first intake of gasp of, of cold air and just you know right. there's an intermediary stage what the f am i still talking i don't know